All right, welcome everyone to the fourth pre-course session for the Science of Logic course. And um, here we're, we're finally gonna be getting to Hegel's own sort of logical um, response to both Kant and Fichte. Um, and I would say like the larger German idealist movement. Um, and Hegel is often seen as the culmination or the ending point of idealism. Um, I've been doing some research recently on sort of what happened after Hegel died, and you could even say, although he was the pinnacle in a sort of Hegelian fashion, as soon as Hegel died, everything kind of fell apart, and there's this impression that what Hegel had, maybe he died too young, but there's this impression that what Hegel had built up during his lifetime was not able to be, let's say, sublated by the various Hegelian schools which followed Hegel, and um, there was a, a return to Kant, and there was a return to empiricism, and there was the emergence of the natural sciences to predominance. Um, and so going into Hegel's science of logic and going into sort of what was his major philosophical gesture in my mind is an attempt to go back to this moment when Hegel died and to potentially reconstitute um, a type of thought and a type of approach to both knowledge and ideas um, that I think uh, still has a tremendous relevance for our world today. So again, the Science of Logic course, I just wanna say before getting into it, starts January 16th. Uh, there are four tiers available at the recorded, the live, the expert, and the one-on-one -on -one level. And you can find out more about that course by going to philosophyportal.online slash science of logic. Again, so in this pre-course session, a lot of the first three sessions was dedicated to setting the scene, setting the stage, so to speak, for the rise of Hegel and sort of the pinnacle moment of Hegel's philosophy, I think, um, of course, can be represented in his um, later philosophies, the philosophy of right and his, his lectures on religion, aesthetics, um, and other phenomena. But the logic is really his his beast of beasts, so to speak. It's his, it's, I think it's his central philosophical gesture. And so now we're starting to get into the real, let's say meat and bones of it. Of course, in the fifth and final lecture, we're gonna be getting into the logic itself and that will be the perfect sort of entrance point to the actual course. <clears throat> okay, so in the last lecture, we focused on Kant's a priori concepts and Fichte's fast, uh, facticity. So, when it comes to Kant's a priori concepts, what we're dealing with is a set of categories which are subjective and which are mediating our relationship to the thing in itself, but are not the thing in itself, right? And you can go into detail of what those categories are and how Kant uses those. Now, Fichte's facticity is basically a word that describes why we are constrained. It can be also likened to sort of the brutal constraints of nature. And this facticity is what Fichte sets up in relationship to this concept of absolute freedom. So this idea that the whole point of the spiritual process is to release ourselves from the brutal natural constraints in nature, which we find ourselves and you know, he proposes thought experiments for that. Now, we went into in the last lecture how Hegel sees both of these as two extremes, um, which actually prevent us from doing conceptual, conceptual work in immediate experience. So what Kant's a priori concepts and what Fichte's facticity become is facticity becomes immediacy and Kant's a priori concepts become conceptual work or mediation. And so the two concepts which structure the science of logic very deeply are the concepts of immediacy and mediation. And he says explicitly in the beginning of the book that nowhere on earth or in heaven is there a, a sort of situation in which there is not immediacy and mediation. So um, this really structures, you have existential immediacy and you have conceptual mediation and they're linked together. Right. Um, and it's from this where Hegel derives what you could call the negation of the negation, or perhaps a more uh, easier way to comprehend it is um, positivizing negativity, which is a concept I've used a lot in my work. So it's 
the point of subjectivity and the point of our conceptual work is to positivize the negativity and not to over identify with the negativity and not to look for an escape from conceptual work. Paradoxically, you know, Hegel would probably say that Kant was actually trying to escape conceptual work by positing a priori concepts, which again, he didn't derive nor develop. Um, and the point of conceptual work is to derive and develop concepts that are related to the immediacy of our being. Now, Fichte's facticity as the brutal constraints of nature um, is for Hegel too much of an over-identification with the negativity of, of being and not enough focus on a conceptual mediation and looking for an escape route in a sort of imaginary idea of absolute freedom. So these are sort of the, the immediate responses from, from Hegel that set up what will become the science of logic. And both of these ideas, the immediacy and the immediation and the positivizing negativity will be found throughout the science of logic. Okay, so the immediacy mediation is involved in the interplay of being and nothing. So um, again, for Hegel, Kant does not derive nor develop his categories, where as for Hegel, we develop, we first, we derive and develop our categories from the immediate experience of the interplay of being and nothing, how nothing comes up in being and being comes up in nothing. I think there are so many interesting examples where this happens in the immediacy of our existence and which create for us um, conceptual headaches because we don't realize that actually the subjective function is to mediate conceptually this strange interplay. Um, and finally, with Fichte's freedom, he says it leads to both formalism and subjectivism. Ultimately, I think you know, both Kant and Fichte's projects in different ways lead to formalism and subjectivism in the sense that the central point of Hegel's logic is to approach the objectivity of the concept by moving through discursive subjective processes and not to get lost in subjectivism. So for Hegel, both Kant and Fichte, while they um, prevent us from falling into a naive form of pre-modern objectivity, they uh, fail to take us from the subject to, let's say in psychoanalytic terms, the subject's object or a conceptual objectivity. And when we, and this is an important note for those of you who, who are interested in psychoanalysis, is that where the connection is between the science of logic and psychoanalysis is precisely in an objectivity, which is in relationship to subjectivity. So like, for example, if you take Lacan's formula of the object petit a, the object petit a is a form of objectivity, which is precisely a lacking object, which emerges from the subject, from the subject's sort of barring from its, its own impossibility. Okay, so Hegel, again, is looking for the truth of the objective concept. And one of the crucial things here is Hegel is against all forms of trying to exit language, to get out of language. And in my experience, both in the sciences, the general sciences, interdisciplinary work, and in various forms of mysticism, various forms of, of spirituality, whether Eastern or Western, there is a desire to exit language. There is this problem because language is so connected to, and conceptualization can be, especially when you're actually trying to think and you're actually trying to conceptualize, which means you cannot get out of the immediacy of the things that are going on in your life right now, that's painful. And so a lot of people try to get out of language. A lot of people try to get out of thinking and Hegel is, and you know, again, for Hegel, Kant and Fichte do not uh, achieve this. They actually try to get out of language with either a form of meta language or a type of extra linguistic idea of freedom. So the whole logic is about um, the development within a discourse and its internal rules. Um, and the content of a discourse is generated by its form. So what does that mean? So it means that you what you can basically, it's almost like Hegel is, and especially from the standpoint of absolute knowing, is getting you to entertain the idea that while you cannot escape language, you can pick and choose what language games you want to get involved with and what language games you want to play. Like, for example, to put it on a meta-reflective level, the choice to sign up to the Science of Logic course 
is a choice within your cognition to enter within a certain discourse. Now that discourse operates by certain internal rules. What's the internal rule? The internal rule is we're studying the science of logic. <laughs> we're not studying another book. We're not studying another theorist. We're studying the science of logic. That's the internal rule of the discourse that you enter. Now that doesn't mean if you don't enter that, that you're exiting language. It means that you might pick a different space within which to explore discourse, which is operating by different internal rules. So next, what does the idea that the content of a discourse is generated by its form? Well, again, bringing it back to what I'm doing, the form of philosophy portal is over determining the content, right? I'm, I'm teaching within a certain form. I'm teaching within a sort of online digital space, um, which is trying to establish some sort of weird quasi university structure. And that form, is the form within which the content will deploy itself. So you can see how the basic structure of Hegel's logic can easily be like, and this is the something I want to teach in the course, even on a deeper level, is the way in which you can easily apply Hegel's logic to what you're actually doing. Right. And, and it's not, and you can apply it to what you're actually doing in a very uh, I would say free way, because it's not like I'm saying, you know, you have to enter this course or you have to uh, become determined by this form. The question is, what language are you entering and what form is over determining the content of um, your, let's say, engagement with language? Uh, and this is an example that can be generalized in many different ways. Okay, so the subject matter of the science of logic is discourse itself. Now, the thesis is um, he starts from the least one can say about something and then identifies a set of categories from that. So again, with Kant and Fichte's system, Hegel thinks that they say too much. They posit too many categories, which actually prevent people from uh, con conceptually mediating their own immediacy. So what, is, what does Hegel do? He starts with a very minimal idea. And that minimal idea is the oscillation of being and nothing. Now he's saying, if that presupposition is wrong, then the rest of the logic doesn't make any sense. So I think that's quite, quite courageous and bold of Hegel to say such a simple idea is the foundation upon which all of this huge work is built. And if that's wrong, the rest of the logic is wrong. That means that if we really try to study and understand Hegel, we can either come to the conclusion that this is the right way to mediate our conceptual work throughout our entire life, or we can identify a flaw with his minimal presupposition and we can then come up with a totally different theory for how categories work and how language works and how discourse is mediated by living beings, right? And I think it's quite powerful. Now, his idea is from this minimal definition, again, that categories are mediating the immediacy of being and nothing, we derive certain categories from the situation and those categories represent the limits of the discourse, meaning that there is no absolute discourse. This would be, I guess, the logic. <laughs> the logic would be a, a type of absolute discourse, but no discourse in which we practically enter existentially is an absolute discourse. And think about how many people enter discourses in an absolute way, right? So again, sort of meta reflecting on what I'm doing and what philosophy portal is, you're given the invitation to enter a certain discourse, I'm not saying this is the absolute discourse. This discourse has limits and understanding the limit. Now, the, here's, here's the difficult thing, but here's what's at stake in actually thinking. What you should do is, and I can give examples of this in my own life, is you should enter a discourse and you should push that discourse to its limit, meaning you should really explore the internal world of a discourse whether that's Buddhism, whether that's Christianity, whether that's Islam, whether that's quantum physics, whether that's communism, whether that's fascism, it doesn't matter. These are all discourses for Hegel. And the point is not to think any of them are absolute discourses, but to, to derive insofar their limit. 
you know, what is the usefulness? What is the historical necessity of this discourse? Since if something like, like if something like, you know, capitalism as a discourse or something like communism as a discourse or something like Buddhism or Christianity as a discourse has the historical effect in concrete being that it does, it must have a historical necessity of some kind or else it wouldn't exist. So the question is, what is the historical necessity of this discourse and where is it limited so that I can perhaps take with me what is best about this discourse and also discard with what is the limit of this discourse? Meaning, you know, again, it's not an absolute discourse. And the same thing I think can be applied to Hegel himself, but that's getting into, um, I think, meta questions on the level of the logic itself, which I definitely think we'd be going ahead of ourselves if we were to approach that idea in a, in a pre-course session, let's say. Okay. So science of logic is a discourse about discourse, which basically means it's a discourse about intelligibility. Hegel is interested in intelligibility. And that is why the science of logic moves from this minimal notion of being and nothing all the way to what he calls the absolute idea, which is for Hegel, the ultimate form of intelligibility. Now, the different discourses define different norms of intelligibility. So again, if you're entering into the science of logic course, uh, there's a certain norm of intelligibility here. Now, it's a meta norm of intelligibility because we're talking about a discourse about discourses. But um, whatever discourse you enter is operating by different norms of intelligibility, which means that um, within that discourse, certain things make sense and certain things don't make sense. Um, and relative to other discourses, uh, a certain discourse might, might make no sense whatsoever. So like, for example, there are certain things within classical mechanics which don't make sense within quantum mechanics. There are certain things within quantum mechanics that don't make sense within classical mechanics. And the same thing can be said about many discourses. So for example, there are things within Christianity and there are things within Islam which are operating by different norms of intelligibility. Like, for example, was Jesus the son of God? That is a norm of intelligibility, which is interpreted differently in Christianity as opposed to Islam. So again, they have different interpretations based on these different norms of intelligibility. Now, what Hegel's interested in is not any, you know, two particular discourses like Christianity or Islam or qu quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. He's interested in the space of possible intelligibility and that's why he, again, works his uh, logic to the idea of the absolute idea. Um, it's kind of a, a way to think about, again, the meta level of discourses. Another interesting aspect of Hegel's philosophy in this way is that formal theory is always real and practical. And so in this sense, he is really trying to push hard for um, saving high level theory and specifically speculative philosophy and speculative cognition. Because for Hegel, theory is always involved in the real and theory is always practical. So it's essential that theorists do not become, and this is like one of the big problems for today is that a lot of very high level theorists are oftentimes not very real and not very practical. Um, I think this is one of the reasons why since I finished my doctorate, I've been really focused on the relationship between um, the intellectual and the personal because theory and the real should be in a relationship with each other. Now, in a Lacanian sense, you could say this means the symbolic, the imaginary and the real are all connected. You can't get out of them, you know? So um, even if you try to, even if you are sort of an abstract intellect, which is not connecting intellectual work to like the real practical immediacy of the situation, you know, your theory is going to be undermined by the real, your theory is going to be undermined by the practical, but also theory over determines the real and the practical. So there's here a very complicated loop or triangle that we are trying to think in relationship to these categories. And again, Hegel's emphasis on this point is to try to save high level theory and high level speculation from being lost to sort of a pragmatic realism, right? Like we shouldn't worry about theory. We shouldn't get lost in ideas. Um, we should just focus on the practical immediacy and real situations um, and discard with theory. Theory is not important. 
you know, Hegel is against this. For Hegel, theory is very important um, and you can't just get rid of it. So in this is a really interesting idea is that um, there is not necessarily a complete intelligibility, let's say outside of the absolute idea comprehending itself for Hegel. Um, in, within every discourse, every discourse, so again, we, should, we could apply like the concept of all and non-all from Lacanian logic where all refers to all discourses and unintelligibility is the non-all internal to every discourse. So there's always some, every, every single discourse has an, what he calls an unintelligible residue. And the crucial thing for thinking is that, again, you go into a discourse, you explore the discourse, you find out its limits, and then the limit is where you'll find the unintelligible residue. And that's where you'll get the clue to the next discourse to inhabit. And this is an important mechanism to understand the way sublation is working in Hegel's mind. Again, the idea of ideal sublation. And I've done this throughout my life. So for example, when I first got into the sciences, I went into evolutionary science and I explored that discourse until I found its limit, right? And I could go into where I think those limits are. But the point is from the limit of that discourse, I then discovered the next discourse that I was interested in. You know, it happened to be Marxism. It happened to be communism, right? Or there are other forms of mysticism that I explored. So the point is jumping to the next discourse. I then explore the internal world of that discourse until I find its limit. And then I jump to the next discourse, right? So you can actually link discourses in a process of sublation, which is related to finding out or discovering the limit inside a certain discourse. So in this relationship, there are key distinctions for Hegel between abstract and concrete, immediate and reflective, material and formal. So on the side of abstract, immediate and material, and on the side of concrete, reflective and formal, this is where we're exploring discourses, right? A certain discourse might become immediately abstractly materially necessary for you to explore, but then by exploring it, you find out its concreteness, you find out its truth in reflection, your singular reflection, and you find out the form of it. But you don't know those things before you go in and explore the discourse, all right? So these are the factors governing Hegel's logic of intelligibility and un unintelligibility. And the whole of the logic is interested in this relation. Now, I think one of the distinctions with Hegel's work and pre-Hegelian logic is that there's not enough attention paid to these processes of intelligibility and unintelligibility, right? There's, there's, it's kind of like the people doing the work are, have not yet derived the standpoint of philosophical knowing or absolute knowing. So there's this, let's say, quick jump to the gun of the idea of a complete abstraction, which is completely intelligible. I know that in the logic itself, Hegel will level this claim at figures like Spinoza. You know, he'll, he'll call Spinoza's absolute substance a pure abstraction, an immediate abstraction, which explains substance or material, but is not concretely reflective and does not understand the nature of form, right? So these are the types of, of ways in which Hegel is making um, a real cut in the history of philosophy, um, which probably is still not uh, fully understood um, or applied in our general, let's say, intellectual spaces. All right, so the distinctions between the material and the formal govern discourse. Now, make a note here of the relationship between material and formal because they're quite related to the concept of materialism and idealism. And notice here, even though Hegel is often seen as an idealist, the reason why someone like Slavoj Žižek could go back to Hegel under the idea of dialectical materialism is precisely because of this distinction between the material and the formal, where the formal is not a positive substance or a complete idea as it is in, he as, as it is in Plato, but is rather sort of the, um, uh, the shape, the pure shape of a notion in the way in which we interpret material. So it's kind of like an interpretive scaffolding. 
Um, and the, that interpretive, interpretive scaffolding or form is basically um, used to uh, derive different subject matters. For Hegel, the material is subject matter or possible intelligibility. So for example, you know, um, there are certain phase transitions in physics, like for example, plasma, which um, we didn't really have an understanding of in classical mechanics or classical physics. So that's a new material, a new subject matter, which is presenting to the form of contemporary physics, a new possible intelligibility, right? There are certain new chemical elements, which are actually the product of human intervention. Those are subject matters, which represent new possible intelligibility, depending on the formal structure of you know, the contemporary moment of physics, for example. Now, we could give other examples from anthropology. Like, so from Hegel's time to our time, we've discovered a lot about other cultures and other sort of ethnic distributions, genetic distributions, um, cultural distributions of humans on a planetary scale. Those represent new subject matters. Those represent new possible intelligibility. Now, the question is, you know, what is the battle of form as it relates to studying those subject matters. So like, for example, you'll have like the emergence in postmodern theory of things like post-colonial theory, for example. Is post-colonial theory as a form the right way to understand the diversity of political economic struggles worldwide, right? This would be a sort of Hegelian question, I would say. So the difference between subject matter and what is actually made present in representation is the consequence of immediacy and mediation. Again, everything always comes back to this relationship of immediacy and mediation, the experience and the concept, and the way in which the concept is sublating immediacy. And the point here is that, like, let's say you develop your own discourse. Like, there are a lot of people who develop new world views, new philosophies. They try to make an intervention. They try to introduce something new into our intelligent world. And what Hegel's saying is that that is possible. You can do that. But you're going to find out the truth of that, that introduction in its concrete manifestation or what is actually made present by the representation of that. So let me give an example with the historicity of communism. Like Marx might have thought initially when he was introducing communism and ideas of communism, of course, he's not the only person who was introducing ideas of communism, but his discourse had an outsized impact and effect on world history. You know, we only found out, let's say the truth of communism in what was actually made present in that idea in the actual implementation of the idea in world history. So like, for example, Marxism leading to Stalinism or Marxism leading to Maoism, that's in some sense the truth of that representation, right? And the same is true for the introduction of religions. Religions find out, for a Hegelian that anyway, for a Hegelian, the truth of a religion is found out in what is actually manifesting in the concrete real of that representation, what is made present by it, right? What is the consequence of its mediation? I could, I could give another example with, for example, classical mechanics, which I've given, I think, several times before. But the idea is, is that for a Hegelian, you're not thinking about, let's say, classical mechanics in terms of it actually representing the real ontology out there. You're rather thinking about classical mechanics and the fact that it led to human beings going to the moon. Right. So what is actually made present in the representation of classical mechanics is the capacity to go to the moon. Right. So this is how we're thinking about discourses. This is how we're moving through discourses. We're seeing what are the consequences of a discourse. Like, for example, my Ph.D. thesis was about global brain singularity. And I was studying, for example, someone like Ray Kurzweil's ideas who whose ideas could literally lead to the manifestation of artificial intelligence, which mimics human language. That might actually be the concrete result of those ideas, right? So we're, we're thinking about what is concretely made real by a discourse, right? It's, 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 it's really important way of thinking, I think. So again, what is actually made present in representation is the real of formalism. And this is the distinction between uh, a, a low level representation and let's say the concrete idea or the real of formula, formalism. So 
The subject matter must be something that progresses through Hegel's concepts of being, essence, and concept. Now, the whole book, The Science of Logic, is mediated by these concepts, being, essence, and concept. And of course, in the course itself, we're going to go into actually really deep detail into what these concepts mean, right? And how Hegel's using these concepts, right? And he's, again, deriving these concepts from the minimal immediacy of being and nothing. And from that being and nothing, he derives essence and he derives concept. And I think in this derivation of these ideas, we can engage like very concrete, simple historical ideas of what other philosophers have said about essence and concept. Like, so for example, when Jean-Paul Sartre says, um, existence precedes essence, right? Does Hegel agree with that? Well, let's go into it. Um, when Plato talks about the absolute idea or the absolute concept, um, did Plato understand how the concept was derived from being an essence? Let's go into that. These are some of like the big philosophical ideas, which I think we need to confront when we're in the science of logic itself. Now, before moving on, the way Hegel uses these concepts is each of these concepts can be linked to a certain register of our psychic fa faculty, which are in themselves contingent, but they're sort of the material, the subject matter we're working with as, as human spirit, where being is linked to the senses. And primarily this battle between being and nothing is something that we find emotionally difficult. It's sensitive, right? Being and nothing are sensitive. Um, essence and uh, essence related to understanding. This is self like, do you, does the understanding understand its own reflection? Do you understand your own essential reflection? That's why in the book, Hegel starts the chat, the, the, the volume on essence with the idea of a shining reflection within oneself, right? Do you understand the shining reflection in oneself? Next with the concept linked to reason, this is basically Hegel sort of stepping into the mind of God in some sense. And he's saying that a sort of a concept that understands its own conceptual becoming is kind of the same thing as the becoming of God. Um, of course, each of us as singularities reflecting the universality are little bits and pieces of God. You know, none of us are the absolute God, but we can understand our part as part of subjective multiplicity in mediating God as a historical entity. Um, but you have to step into the concept as concept, right? And, and you have to understand reason um, as in a process of unfolding truth, right? These are, these are sort of the things that are at stake in the, the Hegelian uh, philosophy. So he tells us that the phenomenological, and this was everything from the phenomenology of spirit, the phenomenological is con contingent and accidental for logic. So it's external, it's basically external phenomena, which is again, contingent, accidental, but logic makes these contingent accidents for itself, right? So like there are many things in my becoming, whether it was um, failing high school or whether it was getting cut from the baseball team in, in middle school or whether it was moving schools when I was five years old, or whether it was going to this university instead of that university, right? These are contingent, accidental, external phenomena, which logic sublates, right? So there's this, there's this idea in Hegel that there's a logical seed. When I give the example before of like an embryo to an adult. And that seed is present from the beginning, but it becomes for itself through sort of the way in which it mediates the contingent and the accidental. Now, there's an interesting connection here between Hegel and Nietzsche in my view, because in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Zarathustra starts to speak as he becomes Zarathustra about sort of being like, at the beginning, he talks about accident as like a giant. And then as he becomes Zarathustra, he kind of sees himself as flying above contingency and accident. And this would be for, for Hegel, the absolute idea, right? So it would be like Zarathustra became the absolute idea in his becoming for itself, right? In his climbing and striving and running and flying, right? So 
very practically speaking, there's a process in Hegel where simple logical judgments, which are, pre again, logic is present from the beginning, even in sense. And these sense, this sense immediacy is, again, playing with being and nothing. Like here you can think about like the first logical judgments that a baby makes, right? What are the logical judgments that a baby makes as soon as it's born, right? This is the, this is the seed form. This is the beginning form. And then as you become an adult, your logical judgments become more complex. And this is the move. And they become more complex because they need to understand self-reflection and they have to understand conceptual mediation, right? So we're moving through being, essence, concept. All right. So logical necessity is to fill the indeterminacy of being and nothing. So there's always this interplay in Hegel between indeterminacy and determinacy. There's an immediate indeterminacy, and you as an intellectual process of sublation are determining. You are conceptually determining. So a determinate becoming is first, for Hegel, determinate becoming, which is the sublation of being and nothing, is the first self-contained category, meaning that other categories on the level of being are not self-contained. They'll oscillate into their opposite. Right, whereas becoming for Hegel in this way can stand on its own, so to speak. And in this mode, Hegel takes a stand against the whole of Western metaphysics from Parmenides. Now, you could say, can we get into the, what is the foundation of Western metaphysics read from the foundation of Heraclitus? That's something we can talk about during the course. How does Hegel interpret Heraclitus? The point here is, and I think like all I want to say on that for this point is that. Whereas Heraclitus and the tradition from Heraclitus negates being, what I would say is Hegel sublates being. And there's a big difference between negating being and sublating being. Um, it might not seem like a lot, but I think in the course, I'd like to go into what is at stake in the difference between negating and sublating being, right? And that has a lot at stake in terms of how we might interpret figures like Parmenides, and figures like Heraclitus, um, which is really the foundation of Western philosophy. So, you know, not no small thing. And again, a lot's at stake here. And when we think about the way, like, for example, Nietzsche approaches Parmenides and Heraclitus, right? I would say Nietzsche probably makes the mistake of negating instead of sublating. You know, I think that, well, we could go into that in the course. All right. So there's a being in becoming. And what is being and becoming? Being and becoming is whatever retains identity in a process. Now, at the same time, that being is never a static, fixed, final being. It is a being that is open to possible determinations in relation to an internal rule. So let's say Cadell is a being, right? Let's presuppose Cadell is a being. Let's say that Cadell as a being at my current stage is trying to build some online school. I'm open to possible other determinations outside of this online school, but it's being developed inside an internal rule. The internal rule is philosophy portal as an online school is exploring modern foundational discourses, right? So I'm open to exploring within, I'm open to exploring possibilities within that internal rule. Now that's not an absolute internal rule for everyone, that's an absolute internal rule for Cadell mediating his concept, right? So now think about how powerful that is to relate to other people if you relate to other people by understanding the internal rule of their being. Because if you understand the internal rule of their being, you'll be able to engage with possible determinations that they might be open to as opposed to closed to. Right now, that's asking a lot, right? It's asking a lot of yourself and it's asking a lot of knowing the other person. But I think it's the right way to interact with other human beings, right? Because otherwise, you're going to be proposing possibilities to people which are not in relationship to their actual internal rule of their becoming. So you're going to be talking past each other, you're going to be operating in different discursive universes. Well, you've got to go separate ways then, all right? Now, Hegel's formula for rationality is internal to oneself. Your, your being is open to possibility via the eternal, internal rule, 
So it's not, again, that you're closed to possibilities just because you're a being. You don't want to just stay that same being forever. You're a your, your being has, has been sublated into a becoming, right? It's just that there's still, and, and the, the internal rule is not an internal rule that is just sort of given by sort of Kantian categories. The internal rule is not some imaginary absolute freedom. The internal rule is something that you've derived from your process of sublating being and nothing. Like, so for example, where did my internal rule come from? My internal rule came from the fact that I didn't find universities to be a truthful space for becoming. So because I didn't find universities to be a truthful space for becoming, I'll just create my own. And, and I didn't find like that the, the intellectual world that we're in really understands the foundation of modern discourse as well at all. They haven't read Hegel. They haven't read Darwin. They haven't read Marx. They haven't read Nietzsche. They haven't read these things deeply, right? So that is where my becoming is coming from. Now that, again, that's not an absolute becoming for everyone, but it's, it's sort of, I'm, 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 I'm disclosing to you how I came to be what I am and telling you explicitly what I am so then you can interact with me better, right? And I think this is a, a good standpoint for, for thinking. So discursivity is a becoming in what is and language is drawn to becoming. What this means basically is that we are all narrativistic or story beings. We cannot escape being in a story. I've told my students a few times that the only secret to what I do is I constantly sublate my immediacy into a story, which is just an unfolding story. I don't know where it's going to end. Of course, it's gonna end when I die, but I don't know where it's, I don't really know how my story is gonna, gonna unfold. Um, I'm, I'm sort of the operator of my story. And as I encounter immediacy, as I encounter new obstacles and challenges, it's up to me as an intelligent being to sublate those into a new story, right? It's not like I'm psychotic and just creating new stories every time some new immediacy happens, right? That's not my psychological disposition. My disposition is to sublate in such a way as that I keep a long-term coherent self-narrative, right? So that someone interacting me when I was 20, someone who's interacting with me when I'm 30, and hopefully someone interacting with me when I'm 40, would have a sense of a coherent life story, right? Which is the result of encountering obstacles, challenges, and sublating them, idealizing them as best as I can. Now, you only find out the truth in the end, right? So, um, like, for example, like, I had the idea when I was 19 that I was going to do a doctorate and become a professor, but I didn't understand the truth of that until I did it, right? So if you're going to school, if you're trying a new adventure, if you're starting a new business, if you're doing a new project, you're never going to find out the truth of it until the end, until it's unfolded, until you find out what it is in and for itself, until it's a concrete discourse, right? So it's very real. It's very, it's very, it goes very deep. Oh, and that's it. <laughs> so, okay, we're stories. Um, and that's sort of the end of Hegel's logical response to Kant and Fichte. Um, and in the fifth and final uh, pre-course for Hegel's Science of Logic, we're going to go into a little taste, a little teaser into the science of logic itself, its development, its interpretations. And uh, again, I think that's the perfect way to enter the science of logic course itself. So, um, if you're interested in joining Science of Logic, it starts January 16, 2023. There are four tiers. Um, and uh, that's the end. So thank you so much for your attention. Let me just get out my notes and then you guys can, we can start a, a conversation. We can, we can enter a discourse. One of the things, one of the things anyway, that I, I like about, about this way of thinking is, yeah, well, uh, I'll say just quickly before I go to you, Max, is that we are thinking about the way thinking unfolds in the real of our whole life history. 
We're not just jumping from worldview to worldview, hopping from this, putting on this hat, putting on that hat. We're thinking about how do I, as a thinking being across the whole of my life, engage in processes of sublation and build out my story and, and figure out what I really am. You know, what is the what is the seed of logic which is growing out of my life history? Max? And then so, Javier. So in the phenomenology of spirit, we have understanding, negation, and then positive reason. How does in the logic so I'm just I'm just finding the, this confusing. How does being essence and comet uh, the concept work as the motor in the logic? Okay, so with being, we're start now. The thing, the whole the whole reason Hegel could derive essence and concept is because being in itself is not a pure complete being. The idea of a pure complete being for Hegel doesn't make sense. That so you can't find that anywhere. Right, so being and nothing are linked, and from being and nothing being linked, he can then derive essence. And es an essence, like in some sense, if you go back to, and we're going to do this in the course, but like if you go back to the ancient foundations of the of the meaning of essence, it's basically about what makes an. In it's basically about individuation of being. If I was to like boil it down to like its simplest essence, what is the essence of essence? Right. What is something? It, what is what is something? Yeah, like, like if you like take like the way I think about it, like, and I you could do this with Parmenides, you could do this with Spinoza, but like being is like one substance, but then essence are the individuations of that substance, right? What makes a chair a chair? What yeah. makes Max Max? What yes. makes Cadell Cadell? Yeah. What's our essence? What makes me different from you? What makes you different from me? We're not the same being, right? So Hegel starts his, you know, and like you'll have people like, uh, again, I, like I mentioned with Jean-Paul Sartre, he will say existence precedes essence, which is a very modern thing to say, right? And what is Sartre talking about? He's going against, guess who? Plato, right? Because what's Plato saying? Because Plato's saying essence comes from the forms. Exactly. Yeah. Right? So Sartre's saying, no. Essence doesn't come from the forms. Essence comes from existence. Existence precedes essence. We make our essence. We make our essence, right? We're processes of development, right? So, um, so there's the link there. I mean, we're going to get into this. And like Hegel has a big dialectical method of being an essence. And like, you know, and, you know, and for Hegel, the category of existence emerges before the category of essence because existence is a being. Right, so he talks about beings. He talks about something which has an existential boundary before he talks about the essence of an individuality, right, in the dialectic. So in some sense, Hegel would say, yeah, existence precedes essence in, in agreement with Sartre. But there's a paradox because after essence comes concept. And what's concept? Concept is idea, concept is form. Right. Oh, so now, so you see, so there's, there's things get more complex than just a typical postmodern philosopher would like to get out of Plato very easily. And Hegel's not going to let you get out of Plato very easily. He's going to make you work for that. Right. And so from the individuality of essence, which comes from reflection within, we get the emergence of your own conceptual mediation. Like for Hegel, you're just unconsciously representing things. Like you picking up language from the external environment, like like uh, Lacan's desire is mediated by the other. Like you're a baby learning language from your mother and your father and stuff like this. But you're not really conceptually mediating yourself until you've done the work of essence, right? You've done the reflection. You've done the work within. Before that, you're just going to be representing things childishly, but you're not going to want to follow it through to see what the thing is. Right. Right, that's much more difficult. You're gonna have to go through failure. It's like, uh, I liked what Daniel Garner said about like the idea of starting an ice cream shop and then actually doing an ice cream shop and being like, I actually hate this, right? Like it's like the, like, it's like the idea, like it's like the idea of um, like, oh, back in November, 2021, I'm gonna start Philosophy Portal. 
versus actually doing it and figuring out what it is. I don't know what it is. I didn't know Max. I didn't know Quinn. I didn't know James, right? I didn't know what the work was going to do or how it was going to impact anyone. That's the concrete idea. And does that come from the essence, the concept, or is, is that working through the essence to the concept? If I hadn't worked, if I hadn't done the inner work, I couldn't mediate the actual idea. I would just give up because it would be too difficult. I, the reason why it would be too difficult is because I would find out that my initial ideas of what it is is just a representation, right? right? I wouldn't have found out what the idea is in itself. And I still haven't found out what the idea is in itself. That means there's still possibility within the discourse. Now, right. let's say the internal rule is I'm exploring modern foundational discourses and I'm interested in engaging people who also want to do that. That's the internal rule. Then the question is, what is the possibility space of this idea? How far can this go, right? It can't go forever. Like it's, I mean, there's a limit to it. And then when I reach that limit, I'll have to sublate into something else and it'll probably be painful. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, so you can't get out of pain in that way, but. Uh, so just, so just one, last, one last thing on this, is, is the, just in between the essence and the concept, is, yeah. Does the concretization come in the concept and is the essence the working through of something? And so the essence, you work through it, then the concept is the concretization of that? So the relationship between the abstract and the concrete are kind of working in all levels, all just right. as like immediacy and mediation right. are working on all levels. Um, but like, like when we think about the level of the concept, you could have the difference between an abstract idea and a concrete idea. And that the difference between the abstract idea and the concrete idea is going to be mediated by negation, negativity. The failure. The failure, right? Your cons, your representations have to go through a lot of failure, a lot of iteration. It's, you know, I think there's like here some link between Hegel and Darwin in the sense that what Darwin is saying about life is that life generates many forms and most of them die yes <laughs> like you just watch like how many turtles are born on the beach and then they scuttle onto the beach and try to and try to get to the ocean but most of them get fucking picked up by birds and shit along the way and then get tossed around by the tides and then get eaten by something bigger than it and then like one or two turtles end up actually growing up to adult age like 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 sperm like sperm you got like who knows how many friggin' sperm you're putting in the toilet every time you do your thing, <laughs> right? And then none of, and that, here are the poorest, the poorest sperm in the modern age of a jack in ma masturbation. <laughs> they, they, the sperm have no chance. They have no, ch like, I'm at, you, you know, you, oh, I've got a chance. No, you're in a condom, right? You, none of you have a chance. <laughs> All of you die. <laughs> right? And that's kind of like how people's representations are right? People, people like have lots of ideas. Like they're like, you go to it, like you can jerk off your ideas to each other. Jason, oh, look at my ideas. Isn't that a good idea? Isn't that a good idea? Isn't that a good idea? And then boom, Jason. no, they're not good ideas. They're going to die. They're all shitty Jason. ideas. Jason, says, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. Is that a dude? <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah. No, no. I mean, Hegel knew the struggle. Hegel knew the struggle. That's why he had a wife and a mistress, you know? Okay, <laughs> we're gonna have your. Yeah, I just uh, I want to understand. I had questions on the limits when you said um, if we when we determine the limit, we can kind of then go into the uh, next discourse. Um, my question is, uh, it's going to kind of extend. Uh, how can we determine the limit when the limit? at least in my opinion, almost feels like it's constantly extending itself. So for example, like the idea that Christianity is complete, um, I'll just give an example of like Nietzsche. So Nietzsche identifies the limit of Christianity, right? And yet ironically, Nietzsche extends Christianity because then Christianity goes into a sort of post-Christianity with like, the advent of like radical theology, Caputo, Derrida sort of contribute to this, the whole death of God discourse kind of starts to extend the limit. Is that, is that what you're talking about when you're, when you're 
when you are expressing that we need to identify the limit and then go into the next discourse, but then ironically that next discourse feeds back into the previous discourse, extending that limit. Am, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, 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 totally. Like there's so many like weird cool examples with this. Like, let me give an example first that relates to like what I know a little bit more about and then maybe we could go into a dialogue about what this might mean for Christianity. Like take for example, the emergence of evolutionary theory with Charles Darwin, right? Charles Darwin introduces a certain discourse now, if you study the history of evolutionary discourse, it's gone through major paradigm changes. Like, for example, with the discovery of genetics, there's what's called a neo-Darwinian revolution, which changes the Darwinian discourse. Like, Darwin didn't know anything about genetics. So Darwin had to be sublated by genetics. But it doesn't mean we have to get rid of Darwin. It just means that Darwin has to be extended. Now, there is a point where you could say, what would get rid of Darwin completely? We haven't reached that point. Maybe we won't reach that point. Like someone like Daniel Dennett would say that Darwin's like a universal acid that can go into every field, right? So we don't know the ultimate limit of Darwin, but there are limits. Like take, for example, that like I'm, for example, in the Nietzsche anthology, exploring what you're talking about with Christianity. And Nietzsche thinks he's negating Christianity, but it could just be that he's pushing the limit of Christianity in a way that it opens a new sublation, right? Like a death of God theology and like, like for example, Zizek is a Christian atheist and stuff like that, right? So we haven't, like, I guess for Christianity, like what would get rid of it completely would be the status of the idea of like Jesus, the crucifixion, the resurrection, like that's like the it's like the, the minimal atom of Christianity or something like that. And that still stands, it seems to me. Mm. Like we could question, for example, the various institutional paradoxes and practices and some of the ridiculous things that the Christian church has done and some of the ridiculous concrete consequences of the Christian church. But the minimal atom of Christianity is still being sublated. It hasn't reached its final limit. There are other religions which precede Christianity, which we no longer even talk about. Like the thing is the discourse dies when no one's talking about it anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. That's right. Okay, um, Jason. Oh, sorry, go yeah, ahead, Javier. That, no, that's it, that's it, actually, that's it. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> okay, Jason? Yeah, I have a similar question, honestly. Um, so when you've arrived at the um, the limit of the discourse, you know, the limit of the intelligibility, um, what allows you to take the next step to uh, sublate it, you know, and does the phenomenology here constitute a kind of like, you know, the inner work required to... Uh, 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 get to the next step, you know, for, uh, let's take Khan, for instance, for instance, right, he kind of just say, oh, there is a limit right there, the end, end of story, you know, but what allows you, what allows you to just to sublet it, what allows you to move on? It's, yeah. So I, I don't think there's any deterministic guarantee here, right? So like, it depends on the spirit's conceptual work, and it's, immediacy i think so like let me give let me i let me just illustrate a story from my personal singularity so where did i reach a limit with evolutionary discourse it was a combination of experimenting with psychedelics and recognizing that political political economy was a big problem right so once i experimented with psychedelics and realized political economy was a big problem i was like evolutionary science as a discourse does not explore this and does not allow me to explore this at all Right, so I have to engage in a sublation from that recognition, right? And so, for example, you could also say, for example, that Zizek, as, ex as an example of a modern philosopher, he does not just go back to Hegel, he recognizes a limit to Hegel. He has a chapter called The Limits of Hegel, where he talks about things like sexuation and the object of TR, ah, and like, that's why he has to introduce sexuality. Right, because Hegel doesn't go deep enough into sexuality. There's a limit in the discourse there, which Hegel reaches, like what which you reach if you explore Hegel. And then, then you have to extend it with something like psychoanalysis. And there are other people who would have different opinions on that. But the question is: you have to ask yourself, what is the major discourse I'm exploring? 
And if there's no major fundamental disruption in your intelligibility, then just keep exploring it. But you're going to realize at a certain point, there's going to be a disruption and, and, and you can't really predict or anticipate that. Like it can blindside you. And then the question is, how do I sublate from that standpoint? Yeah. I guess uh, it's like Kant reaching a limit and saying end of story. It's like there's a story of Kant's day to day life where he really struggled with being disrupted. <laughs> right. Whereas Hegel's like, you've got to include that internal disruption. You've got to become friends with that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, we, we, Max and I, and uh, James as well, we had this talk uh, several days ago about precisely this, you know, the different methods you can uh, take to approach the question of being or to, to tackle Hegel. And then I, I think there are many ways, but the problem is that once you reach, yeah, what, once you reach the end of the discourse, you kind of have a choice to either sub sublet it or to just, yeah, to, 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 to don't want to be disturbed. Exactly. And the reason why most people fall into static worldviews is precisely because they don't want to be disturbed. Yeah. I'm happy here in the worldview that I have, don't want to be disturbed. And, you know, and my view is fair enough. I don't think like when I was a younger, younger man, I would try to disturb people's internal rule. I don't think that's the mature way to do it. I think the mature way to do it is to understand what someone else's internal rule is and let them figure out the limit of that internal rule by themselves and try to be the best person you can be to bring out the best possibilities in relationship to their internal rule. Like it's very a childish teenager thing to do to like recognize someone else's internal rule and say, I'm going to deconstruct your internal rule. I can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it, it's interesting how uh, this kind of childishness can be taken as a process of maturation later on where, you know, it's it, yeah. in a way you're sublating this very thing. Uh, I have a second question, but uh, I have to, sure, I'll, I'll preface this by saying it's also Max's question. Um, so uh, <laughs> we had this small debate the other day, uh, as I said, and um, uh, what do you think of so, okay, uh, earlier you mentioned that, okay, you want to start with the least presupposition. You want to you wanna, uh, get to the limit of something. And what do you think of the approach of something like a Zen meditation or an Occam's razor to achieve this sort of thing? Do you have any... Um, I'm, I'm asking this really badly. Max, could you... Uh, swoop in yeah basically we were talking about being and yeah we were so disorientated about being we didn't know what was going on but then we had a we felt like we had a breakthrough there last night where um jason had come and said well you can sort of use being as a, a zen as a way to get to being in the same way that hegel did at the start of the science of logic and then I was coming in and saying, well, you can also use a sort of gesture of Occam's razor, not not the exact Occam's razor, but this idea of reduce, 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 reduce right. until you get to being. And then we were sort of postulating about, well, is this the is this the right way in? Is this what Hegel was doing from the phenomenology and absolute knowing in order to get to being at the start of science of logic? Are we on the right track, basically? But I, I will, I will, I will say that I think we ended with uh, the idea that basically all roads kind of lead to Rome in a way, you know. Like, but but that, that is still the last part. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're, okay. we're concerned that, right. like, you know, if you do get on a bad road, you might just go off and study logical positivism and never get to Hegel. You well, know, you're so concerned. I'm, I'm cool. <laughs> that's, that's my concern. That's... I'm cool with that. So to me, you would only end up with logical positivism if you, um, if your philosophy was a sort of positivity with no negativity, right? Whereas Hegel says that reason is both positive and negative. Reason can both, and reason as positive is more in service of the understanding, and reason as negative is more dissolving the understanding. So logical positivist is more basically identifying with a form of the understanding which reifies atoms and void as an external thing as opposed to at the zero level of your being. 
right? Like basically, you know, you are, let's say a logically positivist atom, but you're equally so an, a logically positive void. You're an atom and a void. And you're actually the split between atoms and void. So anyway, that would be like the Hegelian negation of logical positivism. But then, you know, I don't know how far logical positivists might defend against that idea that they're atoms and void or they're something and nothing. Now, in terms of the phenomenology of spirit, you can imagine the phenomenology of spirit. And, and, and Lacan also talks about the object Petia in this way as he, he describes it as a deciduous process, a process of shedding. Like, so we talked about a process of failure, a, a process of shedding. Things like Occam's razor or Zen meditation, they might be like um, tools that appear on this path of shedding. Like you might, like Occam's razor can be useful at certain points. Zen meditation can be useful at certain points. I've gotten into meditation before, you know, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you'll come to the same sort of conceptual conclusions that Hegel comes to, you might. Um, it doesn't mean if you come to different conceptual conclusions, you're, you're wrong either. Um, like, for, like for Hegel, one of the biggest sort of um, con concepts that might be connected to Zen meditation or Occam's razor is the dialectics of skepticism, like the way in which skepticism leads to contradiction. Right. I don't know if I don't like I've heard I, I would imagine that I would maybe Javier knows, but um, I don't know if Zen meditation leads you to sort of the reality of paradox or, you know, accepting paradox or having a different view of paradox. But if, if that's the case, that's kind of similar. Um, but Hegel says we have to work with contradiction. You know, we have to and we have to have like sort of a let's say you could say a, like Bard, for example, says that like Hegel's absolute knowing and Zen are kind of like Eastern and Western versions of each other. For example, I, I don't know. In, like, I think like the difference with Hegel's phenomenology of spirit is that he really derives the historicity of absolute knowing. I don't know if Zen meditation derives the historicity of that in the same way that Hegel does, but I also don't know enough about it to say yes or no about that. I, I will also add very little, and I, 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 I don't know much either, but with Hegel, there is an emphasis on intelligibility, whereas um, Zen may or may not really necessarily care about such a thing, but when I went to a Buddhist yeah. temple, the first thing I, I went for like a week retreat at this, uh, it was like um, Thich Nhat Hanh's Buddhist Center um, is a form of Buddhism. Um, the first thing I noticed when I went to the urinal was they had a sign over the urinal that said concepts are just in your head. <laughs> Maybe, like that's sort of like the main theme of the, the, the retreat is like, get rid of concepts, get rid of concepts. And I think the main difference I see between Buddhism and Hegel is the disposition towards concepts. Absolutely. But I, I do see a lot of affinities, but yeah, once you reach the end, you just have to make, like make the jump and that's complete, you know, yeah. But what does that have to do with being? Sorry, Dimitri, can you, can you, uh frame that <laughs> like like you saw it when you went to the urinal uh-huh well Hegel actually does talk about the penis and the phenomenology of spirit I think they have yet to come to this point you know that the penis is at once the highest the function of insemination and the lowest because it's urination maybe those people they have not yet come to this point of insemination I'm not sure about that. I'll have to think yeah, about no, it. That's, I, I, I often think that, that Buddhism is actually a, a, a spirituality of infertility. It's an it's a infertile spiritual structure. Whereas I think Hegel is, is he's, he's interested in the fertility of the concept. And I think like from philosophy, like from Socrates, like Socrates would say, the philosopher is the midwife of the concept. There's this idea that the philosopher is birthing concepts. There's this idea that the philosopher is engaged in, like even Deleuze will say the job of the philosopher is the creation of new concepts, right? So this is, this is an important uh, aspect of philosophy, which I think is very life uh, affirming in a sense and, and very, um, like even for example, with Nietzsche's philosophy, you have the child as like, it's, it's about fertility. It's about, you know, the new, and even like, for example, in Hegel's science of logic, 
one of the major themes in Hegel's science of logic is deriving a new quality, something new, from a process of measurement and quantification. This is very important as well. So go to Javier, then Chetan, then Max. So I think this question of like, so just to answer like your, your initial question, yeah, technically Zen Buddhist meditation is supposed to lead you like to understanding paradoxes with its like practice with koans. The idea that you meditate on a koan is supposed to sort of break logic of your understanding. Uh, <clears throat> but I think the caveat here is that just like the way St. John of the Cross wrote, um, I think, Dark Soul of the Night, um, we have to understand that, for example, I think a lot of people get caught when they get like into, I think maybe there might be a sort of penetration of like Western idealization about Zen meditation that sort of leaks through um, a sort of Western fantasy about escapism that sort of kind of blooms because Christianity is no longer a satisfying answer. Um, and I think when, you know, when you start studying the history of Buddhism, at least J J Japan, Japan has just became very westernized. Um, so I sometimes I wonder the very product of Buddhism, the way we understand it now, Zen meditation, mindfulness, there seems to be a sort of lingering, abs uh, lingering presence of Western understanding that is actually very Christian. And it kind of still falls into a type of escapism um, where, you know, so, okay, but yeah, I'm, I'm digressing, but anyways, yeah. It's supposed to, right? It's supposed to. Um, but I think it's more about, I think the question we need to be asking is not the particular method, if the particular method get us there. The question that we need to be asking are, what are the conditions that allow for a genuine unfolding of a sublation, right? It could be, it could be a Zen meditation, but is Zen meditation for you the same way a man that decides to start an ice cream shop is it always for everybody that they start an ice cream shop, right? Um, so it just could be the case that when you decide to do Zen meditation, it's not going to get you there, right? And so it's this, I think we have to pay attention to Derrida's logic of the same, where it's like people start going, oh, Zen meditation is different from Christianity. Let me try that, right? But then it just becomes a sort of little subtle fantasy to hide Christianity and go through an escapism, basically. So we have to be very careful about the sort of logic of the same, because if the logic of the same is still being consistent when you're going from the next discourse to the next discourse, I think the trouble is we won't find that limit necessarily, right? We'll, sit our, we'll get ourselves trapped, right? The person that rejects Christianity falls into the same trap that he now goes into Zen Buddhism, right? So we have to be very like, pay very close attention to, to this logic because, you know, in my opinion, if you don't really work through Christianity, um, you can become victim to the same logic that sort of underlying Christianity when you go into the different discourse. And I think that's the main thing that I'm trying to say. So when I say that, I think we need to start thinking, what are the conditions for allow a genuine unfolding? This is the question. It's not about, is it Occam's razor? Can we do with this? It's perhaps, maybe, but again, what is the real condition that allows for this? This is the question that I think is important. Maybe just maybe just read Hegel is the only the one. <laughs> no, no, it's. It, I think I think it's it's. I just want to before I get to Chitin, I just want to. I, I don't, man. I think what what Javier is saying is super important. I just want to emphasize that I think the way Javier is approaching this um, situation so interestingly is an example where we have to take into con consideration the historicity of Buddhism and the cultural context of Buddhism. You don't just have Buddhism in a void or Buddhism in a vacuum. Like you have the historical, like what is Buddhism in Japan in the 15th century versus Buddhism in Japan in <laughs> the 21st century and Westerners coming to Buddhism versus Buddhism coming you know, to a different area of the planet or something like that. There's all of these questions that I think um, you can't get rid of the historicity of the thing. And anyway, there, I could go on about this, but I want to get to to Chitin. And thanks for that, uh, Javier. 
Thank you, Kettle. Uh, thanks for starting this course. Actually, you know, maybe we we all will read you know, science of logic because of you. <laughs> Uh, I haven't read through science of logic uh, actually myself, and I haven't, I haven't worked through you know, but I just generally have a have a, have a discussion or a question in my mind which you know been troubling me. So essentially, what we're trying to think here, in, as far as I can understand, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, say one of the ways to sort of conceptualize this problem of say representation and logic has been that that there is something common between language and reality, which is why language can represent reality. Isn't it? And you, you can put essence over there. You can put platonic forms there. You can put, you know, all of, all of that historical. Uh, but underlying idea in in that in that in that game was that there is something common or uh, needs to have something in common. Language needs to have something in common with reality, so that that match can take place. Uh, on the other side, um, the arguments, let's say, you know, coming from. You know, one can see that in Wittgenstein, for instance, early Wittgenstein, later Wittgenstein, that that language doesn't need to have something common reality with reality. Language itself, in in some sense, constructs reality, and we can get into those kind of metaphors. And you know, Wittgenstein uses the tool metaphors of language in that sense. It becomes a usage game that how you use language, and we can get into Foucault and um, uh, I, I, as far as I can understand, Hegel brings the negativity into the picture, that he's saying that this relationship is possible not because of something positive in language, but because something absent in language. Uh, you know, that, 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 that absence actually structures this relationship between language and reality, rather than something positively being there. The you know, unconscious being structured like a language, those kind of metaphors uh, sort of, uh, you know, stem from, um, uh, um, that, that's how I, I, I've been sort of, Thinking about something of this nature, uh, but if you move forward in the in this kind of a problematic um, so sort of you know uh, picture that, that that in which Hegel is trying to I think solve for us, where do you where do you see, trace the, these two questions? One is what is Hegel's theory of logic in this in the in, in, within this you know uh, that his logic of course is not Segean Segean logic in that sense, isn't it? It's not Segean's logic. There's something different happening at, the, at that level, which is very really different, has a different relationship with language. The other is how, how is he thinking about this relationship between form and matter that you referred to? That what what in what ways is he distinguishing between form and matter? And, and what 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 does what effect does that happen in Marx and material dialectical materialism? Is is that same that something that happened in Marx, something changed in Marx? How do you look at that story? Um, yeah. Thanks. I have another one actually. But I'll ask that later. Yeah. <laughs> as, as, as always, Chitin, you ask the most challenging questions, and then that's that's why I like to. That's why I'm happy you stay around here. Um, <laughs> so the first the first the first thing is that I I think you're right to say that for for Hegel, um, the relationship between language and the idea is possible because of something absent in language, meaning that there's from the very first this relation again between something and nothing, or presence and absence. And so from that, this is where he derives uh, the, the possibilities of the idea. And so that's the difference between Hegel, I think, and Plato is that he, I think for, for Hegel, Plato jumps too quickly to the idea without deriving it and doesn't really see his own involvement, the historicity of the idea and so forth. In terms of um, how is Hegel thinking form and matter and what might, what might consequence this have for Marxism? I think the crucial thing here is that the truth of the subject matter um, is in the concrete form after a process of development. And I think that Marxists too quickly substantialize the form as, as a necessity before it happens. Like for example, the uh, world communist state is necessary and we are actors of this state and we are going to make it happen and we know we are going to make it happen. For Hegel, this is silly. For Hegel, this is going to lead you to be dialectically undermined. And that's exactly what happened. So there's a way in which, like for example, when I built Philosophy Portal, I didn't have any idea that um, I would get an endorsement from Slavoj Žižek with him calling enter the alien communist. I didn't have an idea about that, but it happened. But only after the fact it happened. 
So this is how we should think communism, you know? We should try to do projects uh, collectively, but we don't know how it's gonna happen. We don't know, you know? <laughs> and, and, and if we pretend we know, that's when we're really going to get undermined. Anyway, that's my uh, Max and then Dimitri, and then we'll close up for the night. Still struggling a little bit with them being essence and the concept. Um, so there's a maturity going on, and how would I, I, I don't know? Tell me if, if I'm if I'm on the right track here with this. Is how would um, being essence and the concept think about something like desire, and then think about something like identity and difference? Well, in terms of identity and difference, it seems to me from my first. Uh, readings of the science of logic that identity and difference are always kind of in a in a, in a dialectic with each other um there are concepts like the, the absolute difference um but it, it seems to me like much more that that hegel's putting identity and difference into into a dialectic where that would be like in relationship you might say identity is related to what's intelligible and difference is related to what's unintelligible and also like when you reach the limits of a discourse you reach the limits of the discourse's capacity to sublate difference, right? So the identity of that discourse can no longer contain that difference and that that's constitutive of discourse. So like, for example, one of the mistakes that Western multiculturalists make is they think that just because they're open and tolerant, it means that everyone's open and tolerant. No, 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 not everyone's open and tolerant. So you're gonna invite certain discursive games into your culture, which undermine your openness and tolerance from within, right? So these types of paradoxes always uh, emerge. And then in terms of desire, I think the point of the phenomenology of spirit is to work through desire. Again, like Lacan bringing up the idea that object petit a is like a deciduous object that you have to shed, right? And Hegel wants you at the point of absolute knowing to study the logic so that you can sort of understand the becoming of the concept in itself and not get it messed up with your desires and representation. So he wants you in the mode of the drive, to put it in Jizhikian language. In Jizhikian language, there's this transition from desire to drive, which is the desire wants the positive object, which in the phenomenology of spirit you shed, and the drive enjoys the loss, and circles itself, which is basically for Hegel close, I think, to the idea of the absolute idea. So I would put drive on the level of the absolute idea. And I would put desire on the level of the necessary phenomenological working through. And okay. Yeah. Is, Go ahead. is it is it fair to say that? the being essence and concept is like a journey of maturity in the science of logic that you start. So how I'm going to start off, to, I'll give you a little window into how I'm going to start teaching the first class of the science of logic, is that we have to understand this in between Kant introducing the critique of pure reason in 1781, the French Revolution happening in between 1790 and, eight, and, and 1799, and then Hegel writing the science of logic in the 1810s. So there's a span here, it's all, it's all connected. So the thing is, is that what happens in the French Revolution is that we lose a political economic guarantee in an external substantive one, a monarchy. And we shift to the necessity of including subjective multiplicity, representative democracy. Okay, and Hegel is saying we can no longer just have a metaphysics of one substance. We have to have a metaphysics which includes subjective multiplicity, but including subjective multiplicity means we have to derive the concept. We can no longer just all agree about an external substance. We must derive conceptual becoming and there's a maturity in that. So the thing is you want freedom, but you don't realize that freedom is going to come with the terror of the abyss of your freedom. And that that's going to require maturity of your own notion because you have to positivize the negativity. 
And where Spinoza will lead you is the absolute substance where all the determinations become, all the determinations are negated. Whereas the positivization of that negation, the, positiviza the positiv positivization of that abyss is the very location of subjective multiplicities become. Okay, that might be too much, but I'm, I'm going to open with that in the science of logic course. So that gives you a little that's good. window. That's good. That's good. Okay, Dimitri, and then quickly Chitan, and then we'll close. Yes. So, um, well, in the, in the doctrine of being, we got all this stuff about quantity, you know, more this, less that. And it's interesting that, you know, in the doctrine of the concept, as far as I've read, and you can shoot me down if, uh, you know, <laughs> if I am a heretic, um, but it's all about the syllogism. So why, you know, if subjectivity is lacking or less than, or subjectivity is excessive, why is quantity over there in the doctrine of being? And what is the connection between the syllogism and the doctrine of the concept? Okay, so these these are the these are the types of questions you need to bring into the course itself because you're asking about the <laughs> intimate details of the book itself. But I can answer very quickly. But these are the questions that you want to bring into the course if you take the course. The first thing is, as it relates to the the concept and the syllogism, is that the concept is not all about the syllogism. The syllogism is a part of this is part is a part of a section in the volume on the concept about subjectivity. The syllogism is a subject is in the subjective uh, level of the concept, whereas when you get into the objective level of the concept, you get into concepts like mechanism, chemism, teleology, and stuff like that. So syllogism is on the subjective side, but if you're on the objective side, you can't forget the syllogism, right? And that's what scientists often do. Scientists think, I can think in terms of mechanism, I can think in terms of chemism, and I don't need to think in terms of syllogism, right? So Hegel saying this is a mistake. Um, on the level of being and quantity is that there's an aspect of the doctrine of being that is dealing with magnitudes, dealing with the size of things, dealing with, and think about this, the way I'm going to start opening this in the science of logic course is think about the relationship between like super clusters of galaxies and subatomic particles, right? Super clusters of galaxies and subatomic particles are both beings of radically different magnitude, <laughs> right? And so you can measure those different magnitudes and that's what he's talking about in the, in, in the doctrine of being, right? So you can measure our star and you could compare the, our star to the size of a super star, like a star that's a thousand times bigger than our star. Like this is the quantity, the magnitude of being, right? And Chitan, quick, I'll say you have the last word, Chitan. <laughs> wow. I, I gotta leave it to you, Jerry. I just asked the last question in that case, and you can answer it. Yeah. So uh, I want to just you know get a quick comment upon the spiritual part of it. You know when you know this idea of there being no concepts in the Buddhist uh, in that. So when I started sort of en en engaging with spirituality in my young days, you know very quickly we we were told that when you simply understand a concept, you can't experience it. You know, in some ways, the very understanding undermines the experience of it. Uh, you know that that if you know, for instance, all life is valuable, the very fact that somebody told it to you can undermine your experience of that 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 concept. What would the Hegelian answer to that question? How would Hegel respond to that 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 problem in that sense? You know, I, yeah. I think I think I think I want to leave our 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 viewers and uh, and and everyone with the with the mystery of that question. Do you want? Do you want? Do you have, do you have a? Do you have a? Do you have a? Do you have a hypothesis? I, I would have done, like to I, see. I've been struggling with that all my life, so you know, I, you, you, it, it makes you doubt whether you want to get into philosophy or not because you understand too much and your experience becomes <laughs> limiting. So I just wanted to know how do you how did you tackle that that kind of a question in your own uh, thinking? Do you struggle with that when you read when you when you think too much about ideas, or is it something which is which comes naturally in that sense? I'll no? say I'll say that 
for mm -hmm. everyone who signs up to the Science of Logic course, I'll answer that question. <laughs> okay, <that is. laughs> I'll leave, I, I answered enough questions today. I'll leave those. Sign up to the Science of Logic course, answer that question. Yeah, that's a good way to tell you. All right, guys, I'm out for tonight. And uh, okay. next, next, next pre-Science of Logic course, January 15th, the last one. Um, and uh, course begins January 16th. So thanks all for your attendance and uh, you have, so a great, have a great weekend. Thank you, Gary. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>